So my, my talk is going to be uh, about planning push motions. This is a joint work with Samuel Rodriguez and Nancy Amaro from the Parso Lab. And um, let's get started. So um, I've seen uh, most of the talks uh, have been more about control rather than motion planning, which it's also, it's also a problem from, for, for control. But I see uh, motion planning in a higher level. Uh, where we want to find a sequence of motions to move our robot from a start configuration to a goal configuration while satisfying robot constraints. But also, uh, one of these constraints uh, includes uh, obstacles, uh, obstacle avoidance. So, um, this has, of course, applications in diverse areas such as robotics, video games, mechanism design, and computational biology. And I'm interested here in the problem of pushing. Pushing is a basic manipulation primitive that has uh, many opportunities for planning. It has been extensively studied in, uh, uh, in control, but not as much in the higher level planning uh, area. So um, since uh, I didn't see many talks about motion planning, let me, let me start with the motion planning problem from the perspective where I, I see it. Um, Sampling-based motion planning is uh, what uh, we've been hearing about uh, all along. Uh, we want to find a sequence of motions for a road from a start configuration to a goal configuration. Here I have a very simple case, a two-dimensional case with a point robot. And we want to find the motions for it to go from the start to the goal. And um, it turns out that for high dimensional robots, it's a very hard problem to do this in a complete way by taking into account the geometrical restrictions of the robot. So a very succe successful approach to planning has been sampling based motion planning, which pretty much consists <coughs> on, identif uh, on sampling um, according to some distribution configurations. Like here we could just sample uniformly and then uh, discarding all the samples that were invalid. For example, if this is an obstacle and there is a sample here, we discard it. And we discard all the samples that are that way. And the, the samples that are left, uh, uh, they are left because they satisfy the, the free property. And that is very simple to test using just some uh, geometrical techniques. Then um, we try to uh, identify some pairs of configurations and try to connect them using the same basic test. And some of them will be very simple to connect. But some of them, like this one, is not going to be possible to connect because there is going to be a collision. So we discard that. And at the end, we, we have what we call uh, a roadmap. And once we have a roadmap, they, then we can search for a path over that roadmap to move from the start to the goal. Um, of course, uh, you may be wondering how about these uh, very uh, discontinuous paths, and th there are all sorts of problems, and I'm not going to talk about those right now, but I just wanted to, to, to mention uh, how sampling-based planners work. Um, in a simple two-dimensional case, you probably can imagine many techniques that could uh, provide better paths than this. But in a high dimensional problem, it's really, really hard and the sampling based motion planners have been very successful. So uh, uh, having said that, uh, let me go back to the subject of my talk, which is pushing motions. So uh, here I will talk about uh, the motivation for studying pushing uh, from the perspective of planning. Then I will show you uh, some uh, preliminary work uh, on pushing with a single agent and then group pushing and I'll, f uh, I'll finish with conclusions. So pushing, a basic manipulation primitive. Uh, we use it for grasping. We can also use it for, for caging. Uh, it's, it's used in many different settings. Uh, in traditional motion planning, as I just mentioned, contact is usually not considered valid because there is a collision between the robot and the, and the obstacles. Um, so how to deal with that still uh, using the motion planning framework or 
uh, sampling based motion planning framework. Um, one uh, important restriction here is that uh, modeling the push motions, in particular modeling the contact, is highly dependent on the physical properties of the bodies involved. How, what is their mass, the materials that are involved, and we can uh, study the, the model uh, from the mathematical point of view for a, each particular case, but pushing happens, uh, we, we probably need to push many different kinds of materials and shapes, so it is uh, usually hard to produce a reasonable model for all the potential interactions. Um, objects have varied shapes and materials. So, so this is what uh, uh, I am studying here. Uh, we want to push uh, objects to guide them through an environment to a goal location. I am restricting the pushing problem into just a simple, simple case. What do we need to do to push, in this case, uh, uh, here we have a, a robot, this is in blue, and it's pushing this box, and we want to push it towards this goal location. Uh, we don't want to have an explicit dependence on a particular model for the contacts between pusher and the objects, and this makes it, uh, makes it interesting. We want to be independent of the geometries and the on material properties. So here I'm going to uh, show a few uh, basic strategies that are based on the geometric state of the agent, the objects, and the desired path. And um, we assume that we can apply uh, some action and then get some feedback on the new world state. So if this was a real robot, then we would need sensors to see what happens after pushing. What is the new state of, of, the, of the world? If we have a simulated environment, well, it is much easier than that. So that, that is uh, the idea. So this is a very simple approach. And as I said, this is just preliminary work uh, for uh, something that uh, we expect is going to evolve into something better. But we also we already have some interesting results. So here is this uh, a very simple algorithm. For here we have um, a robot, in, in this uh, example the rod is right here and this is an object. So uh, if there are many objects in the environment, we find an object of interest for the robot and we generate a push position on the back of, the, of this object. In order to generate this push position, uh, we use a sampling based motion plan to produce a, a roadmap for the whole environment. And in this roadmap, we probably will find a path for this object, this particular object, uh, that it needs to, to, for, to find a path that it needs to follow to go to some goal location. So if we have that path already, we find uh, a, a push position for this object. And then if the object is far from if the robot is far from the object, then we need to get closer to that object. Initially, in order to get closer to that object, we can use that same roadmap. A roadmap used using the technique that uh, I just described. If the robot is closer, is relatively close to the object, then uh, we start um, incremental exploration using a, a tree-based planner it is also a sampling based planner. It's just different than this one in the sense that instead of planning globally, it starts planning wherever is the robot and explores around where there are some paths close by. So this, uh, here is what we see here. This, kind, this exploration is uh, seen as this. This is a, a tree. And we do this in order to find a path that gets uh, the robot on the push location. And once we are in the push location then, uh, we apply some basic strategy for pushing. After pushing then is when we uh, use the feedback on how the push went uh, to decide what is the next mo motion for pushing. So um, the simple strategies that I will show are really, really, really simple. They are just based on geometric properties and here I am assuming that the, or, um, let me go back. I'm assuming that we that the robot is already behind. This is a robot, and this is the object that it needs to push, and this is the goal for the robot. So here we are assuming that the robot is already behind the object, 
and we are assuming that there is already a goal for this object. How was the goal computed? Using a sampling-based planner, as I said. It's uh, just uh, some of these configurations in the map. So simple strategies. Uh, we can move along this vector that goes from the center of the robot to the center of the obstacle. This is the two-object strategy. We can uh, move uh, along the vector that goes from the center of the robot to the goal location. Uh, we can use a with offset strategy, which is going to weigh the, the sub-goal strategy to with an offset component that compensates, uh, that is based on the, on the vector that goes from the, from the um, location of the obstacle and the location of the goal. And we can play around with these two parameters, uh, S1 and S2 parameters. They are just weighting parameters. And uh, uh, we manually explore these parameters, but this, there is a potential for learning these parameters as well. And we also used an adaptive strategy that is uh, learning actions based on previous performance using reinforcement learning. So the three first strategies are really, really simple. The fourth strategy I will explain a little bit more. Um, so this adaptive strategy uh, decides uh, an action which is an angle. So here I have is the same picture, but from the other, other pers perspective, this is a robot, this is the obstacle. And this is the goal location. So if we, um, I remind you, we want to move this obstacle to the, to the goal location. And uh, we try to learn the angle that this pusher, the robot, needs to rotate from the direction between the robot and the object in order to push that obstacle. And um, we um, use as an input, the, as a state for this uh, system, the angle between these two vectors between the robot and the obstacle and the robot and the, and the goal. This is really simple and here we were just trying to explore whether this could work. We know there are many uh, other parameters that we can take into account to, to produce better motion, but we just wanted to do a preliminary exploration for this. Uh, so um, one more restriction is that both uh, theta and alpha are discretized and um, this is a, a limitation that can be addressed as well in uh, using uh, techniques that work for continuous states and continuous actions. Uh, but here we are using just a discretized, limited, uh, very primitive version of reinforcement learning. And this is pretty much the, the way the, the reinforcement learning works. So we measure this, the vector, uh, the vector between the obstacle and the goal. Uh, then uh, we compute uh, the angle alpha, which is uh, based on uh, selection, based on the, a probability distribution for the actions that is learned based on the states uh, with this algorithm. We apply that action, it means we, we move, uh, we rotate the, the, the agent and, and move a little bit forward, and then we compute new robot position and new object position. If uh, the robot, if the object moved, then uh, we compute what we call the object motion vector, which is the difference between the previous location of the object and the new location of the object. And we compute a reward, which is going to be a projection for, for this, of this vector on, on top of the, uh, of the vector that goes from the obstacle to the goal. So pretty much we compute how much motion was effective. If, if, uh, if the whole motion was on the, on the direction between the object and the goal, it's going to get a maximum reward. If it is just partially on there, then the, the reward is going to be also partial. If the object did not move, then we uh, compute uh, the robot motion vector, which is how much the robot moved. And the reward is going to be based on the projection of the motion of the, of the robot and the, the vector that goes from the robot to the, to the obstacle. So how much it, if, if it approached the obstacle, it's going to get a high reward. If it didn't approach the obstacle, then it's not going to get much reward. So just using this simple strategy, uh, once we computed the reward, we apply the reward to the pair. Uh, um, action state, 
or state action, and then we update the probability distributions. I won't go into details on how this is computed. It's just using, um, um, it's going to give more weight to the successful actions and less weight to the less successful actions. It's, um, there are better reinforcement learning algorithms, believe me, but this was just a proof of concept. So uh, what we, these are some results. Um, so this is an environment that has just one obstacle, goal location, four boxes. And we measured a few things. Uh, let me go through each of these metrics. Uh, the idea was to move all these uh, boxes to this goal location, and this is a robot. Uh, these are our strategies, and we measure number of pushes that uh, we perform with each, each of these strategies. This number of frames is pretty much how long it takes to, to solve uh, the simulation. It's not measured in seconds, but I if it was a real case, instead of computing number of frames, we, compute, we would compute time. Uh, this is the distance that the pusher, um, uh, that, the, that the pusher uh, moves and the distance that the object moves. Uh, this distance for the object is the sum of the distance all the objects go through. <coughs> so. Uh, we tried just two push forces. Um, if you um, are more interested in the model of the, of the push action in low level, well, the push force is very important here. This is another simplification we, we, we used. Uh, just try two different forces. This is one more parameter that we could learn. But we just applied a high and a low one. And uh, well, this is, these are our results. Uh, the, the numbers don't tell uh, um, whether there is something that is much better than the other methods. But one interesting thing here is that the adaptive method, where we didn't incorporate much uh, information to the, to the system on how to push, uh, was able to perform sometimes better than other methods. Uh, sometimes worse, but not, uh, not radically worse. And it's not using much information. It can learn better things. Uh, in terms of distances, well, uh, we can uh, compare the different numbers, but uh, we see in general, uh, and we'll see that in the other results I'll show, that this with offset the strategy that is trying to balance whether to push towards the goal or, or whether to push towards the, the obstacle, uh, did really well. We had to parameterize that a little bit and it worked re really well and that's our, one of the next things we will do in the adaptive strategy instead of learning just this angle, simple angle, we will learn also the parameters for the with offset to see whether we can do better than the with offset strategy. So these are just uh, some results. Let me see. Uh, this is another set of results with different set, different object types. So in the previous uh, environment, uh, we used boxes. In the next one, we used um, triangles. Uh, so one component that I didn't emphasize here is how we got this feedback on how the, on, on what was the result of the action. How, how did we determine this? These are simulations and the feed, feedback was obtained uh, through a physics engine. We used bullet for that. Um, and we hope that we can apply the same technique just if, if we replace this uh, physics engine with a uh, real robot and sensors that tell us uh, just the location of, of where are the objects. So here we use, uh, oh, let me go back, the triang triangles. And again, we had a good performance. Again, the adaptive, in this case, the adaptive technique was better than the other three. Um, in this case, it was not. The, the with offset technique was better. Uh, the different metrics are similar. I'm pointing to pushes because the others uh, are not that different. Th there are some differences. Yes, sometimes there is a method that has uh, less pushes and more distance, but there we didn't see a huge differences uh, in, the, in the metrics that we used. Uh, here is a different environment. Our, this environment has uh, cylindrical obstacles. The, 
it's very tiny here to see what are the objects. This is a robot, but this is a, a close up. This is a duck. It's not clear, but this is a duck, uh, a duck model, and this is a, an hexagon. Um, and um, we see similar results. So um, we, we are happy to see that we could apply these simple strategies for, a problem, for, for this problem. Let me show you a, a video. Let me go back to full screen. Uh, so we see here um, the, the road is pushing. Uh, sometimes we see uh, these little dots. Let me move away the mouse. The red ones are the, the small explorations that it needs to perform every time it gets too far from the, from the box. And sometimes we see uh, the next goal, like, it's not clear, but these are changing color when, when uh, for the next goal. This path, I uh, emphasize, this path was obtained through a roadmap-based sampling-based planner. Uh, so here is that with offset the strategy, we see the two, uh, sometimes it's switching from one side to the other one. Uh, this is the adaptive strategy. Sometimes it does really well, sometimes it really does poorly. The two object strategy with these triangles. We compare this also with a user manually selecting where, where to push. It was really hard because it's very hard to do it on, in, in real time. And it's like playing a video game, so <laughs> the, the other strategies work better. But uh, actually, we would need to compare it to an actual person pushing on one side or, or the other one, because there the challenge for the pusher is going to be <laughs> learning how to move fast with a, with a mouse or the keyboard. This is adaptive strategy. So there you see those points that are moving. It's uh, trying to move really far from the, from the path. Our goal here is to move on the path. So uh, by far, we're not getting the best <coughs> results yet. So there we see where that it briefly pushed more than one object. That, that was a dock, I think. Yeah, here is another dock. So, so in, a, in a moment, I will talk about an extension of this problem, which is going to be on, on group pushing. But uh, before I go uh, uh, to that problem, do, do you have any questions so far? No. Okay. So, yeah. Wait. 
what if you what if you think that the robot is like lead direction? It's like the motion direction and just, just the motion direction. Okay. So if it, it's it's moving in this way, it, it learns whether it needs to to change direction. Okay. Pretty much. Not the size of the of the vector. Just no, the, okay. just the direction. Yeah, and we know that's a limitation. If we include the 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 the, the, the force, which would be the size of that vector, we could probably have much better motion. You know, in some sense, this seems similar to. There is some works that actually Jan Bernard and I we were seeing recently. There is like a global planet and a local controller that is optimizing something. So this is kind of this kind of sense, this kind of feeling, but it's other techniques. It's like learning for the local modification. It's um, the same idea in general. The the initial plan is global, and then the local part is two phases. One part is to, to approach the obstacle or the object that we need to move. And the last part of the global, which is kind of um, much more local, is what, it, what we are learning. So here we have three, three phases. Um, what we thought well, it was an advantage for the sampling-based planners was that, uh, I mean, First, the, the roadmap base, which has a very broad picture. Then the RT, which is very powerful in uh, locally. And then the motion for pushing was different because we don't have a model. So we wanted to, to see uh, that part in a more fine uh, detail. Yeah, but the, I'd be, I'll be happy to, to talk about that because I, uh, that work that you mentioned, it's Yes, it's from Jules Vandenberg. Ah, uh, okay. 2012, I think, 2013. I'll check it out. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, so that was um, the video. I think I need to go back to the. to the full screen. OK, so as I said, we have an extension for this, which is group pushing. And here, the technique is very similar. We, uh, here is just, I, I'm just showing the behavior. But before we get to this, uh, we also have a roadmap-based uh, uh, plan uh, where we can find global paths. Then we also uh, use RTs for local motions, and then we use some uh, strategies for, for moving with multiple robots moving multiple objects. So here we have an example. These are objects that we want to move as a group. And here we have, in this case, I think we only have a robot. Well, there are many potential robots here. These three robots. These three robots need to coordinately move these five objects. And the same basic strategy, here we don't use learning. Uh, where uh, This is a kind of the, the other um, side of, of this uh, problem. Uh, we are more interested in how to coordinate the actions of multiple pushers. And locally, we can apply the different techniques that I, I talked about. So here, uh, first, we identify a, a, an object set. I, here there is only one group of objects. It's clear these are, are grouped together. But in an environment, there could be potentially hundreds or thousands of objects. So we, can, we want to identify first an object set. And once we have an object set, then we choose, uh, we find a path for a group of pushers to move behind that object set. And we want to generate push actions or group, regroup actions. If this object set is already a group, then we want to find what actions each of the other of the robots need to perform in order to push this group towards their, their goal. If they are scattered because of the motion, then we want to be able to regroup them. So this is more like a strategy thing. And I won't go in, into uh, much details of this. Uh, what I will say is we have different ways 
um, we have explored different ways of, uh, of making both the groups and finding what is the right direction for the robots to move and how to regroup them. Uh, different strategies for all those stages. And now I will just show you some, uh, some results. And I will talk about the strategies uh, while the video is playing. So this environment, you see, uh, we need to move all these objects to the goal, their goal location. Uh, and these squares are the robots. So here we identified a candidate group and we are pushing sometimes the group as in a formation towards their next sub goal. And when we identify that the group is scattered, then the, the robots go back to try to, to push uh, together all the objects again. Um, here we are uh, again, we are doing the same, we are observing what is the output. So we don't know any model about the objects, we only see what are the results for pushing. Here we still have an applied learning because this, this was, uh, we had to deal first with the general strategy and we are going to apply learning uh, as one of our next uh, goals. Uh, but you can see, we're, we're already, uh, with this simple, it's very simple technique, able to, to move the, the different objects to, to, the, to the goal location. Um, the decision on which objects are going to be moved is uh, made um, continuously. Even the group might be dispersed so much that the, groups, the group definitions change. So here, uh, so we have several strategies. One strategy is uh, making a line behind all the objects and push uh, as a group. Uh, we have another technique where uh, we form kind of a hook behind them. It works uh, nicely. Uh, we even have a technique where one, some of the pushers are um, mixed with the, with the objects. Uh, they are assigned a few, a few of the objects and try to to take advantage of some objects being behind many other objects to be able to push many of them together. Um, so it's pretty much the same uh, basic technique. So you, you'll see a few more strategies here. So I, here we have a lagging objects, uh, which is uh, we are we can leave behind some objects and focus on the on the ones that are uh, giving us a better performance. And this technique ac actually was uh, very efficient compared to the one that was just using a uh, line formation. although they spread apart and get back together, but this is a line formation, different types of objects. And you see that sometimes we try with more, I think we tried up to a few hundred objects. Here, we're trying to maintain the group, but some of the objects are, are, are lagging behind. Here you see some inefficiencies because it moved some of these objects first to here while when it could have moved them right away in this area. But this, the, the method doesn't know that there is no obstacle here. It only knows where, where is the map. So I, I am not showing the underlying map, but uh, 
So here, there it tries to move them towards their closest goal to, to the group as a whole, not to a particular object. So there are many things that here can be um, learned. So this is, um, let me just close this. So um, finally, in conclusion, uh, here we integrated uh, global roadmap based motion planning with a finer grain based, tree based planning to find tune a path to a goal location. We apply several push strategies. We, le we apply learning and it shows very good potential. And we have uh, already some uh, ideas to, by using first uh, continuous uh, state spaces and action spaces. And uh, we presented here an extension to handle group pushing. Uh, so this is, uh, as I said at the beginning, joint work with Samuel Rodriguez and Nancy Amato from the Parasol Lab at Texas a &M University. And here are some of our sponsors. And that's it. Question or comments?